goodness. Happy Easter! Oh, man. Come on, you can do better than that. This is the Super Bowl of church, people. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, man. And we just came off a of spring break here in Livingston County. How did you like that big yellow orange thing or big yellow round thing in the sky? Wasn't that amazing? Can you believe they're calling for four inches of snow tomorrow morning? I can't believe it. Oh, Dave, that's not even funny. Don't even go there. That's just, it's past the point now. Come on. Hey, happy Easter. I'm Dave, and uh, man, uh, you know, our goal is to help people take next steps with God. And I'll just tell you right up front, I hope that you leave here a little bit closer to God than when you came in. I want you, or you and your relationship to Jesus to go like this and not like this. Because here's the deal. How many of you know that relationships are either moving closer together or they're drifting apart? I mean, you have a business relationship, it's either coming together or it's drifting apart. You have a, a marriage relationship, it's either coming together, drifting apart. Same thing's true with God. Uh, you know, I, was, uh, I came from Kentucky, and uh, the guy that baptized me has been driving the same old pickup truck for 20 years. This thing is falling apart. And he and his wife were out for a drive one day, and they pull up to a red light right behind a brand spanking new shiny Ford F-150 super cab, super diesel, everything. Huge, right? And the wife it just begins to notice this couple in the brand new truck, and she's enthralled with the romance because this girl has scooted all the way over next to the guy. You know what I'm talking about? In the cab of the truck, and he's got his arm around her, and she's just kind of whispering sweet nothings in his ear, just kind of doing this on his ear and everything. And she looks over. Now, she was enthralled with the romance. My friend said, I was enthralled with the truck. That thing was beautiful. <laughs> Anyway, she looks at him and she goes, honey, honey, you remember, that was us 20 years ago when we bought this truck. That was us. How come we're not like that anymore? And my friend, in a moment of masculine genius, he says, well, I haven't moved. <laughs> hey, if the person next to you is not laughing, explain that to him, okay? Now, here's the unique thing about Jesus. Here's the unique thing about our relationship with Jesus. If you feel that you have drifted, listen, if you're farther away from Jesus, listen, Jesus hasn't moved. God hasn't moved, right? And that's the good news about Easter is that, you know, this is that Sunday where if you haven't come to church in a while or if you've never been to church, this is that Sunday where a lot of people will come or they'll come back. And you know what? Jesus doesn't sit here and go, oh, I'm disappointed in you. I'm so tired of you. I can't believe it. Jesus says, I want you back. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you're here too. Listen, I want to tell you a story today about a guy whose relationship with Jesus drifted and then how Jesus brought him back. It's a beautiful story. The guy's name is Peter. And in Mark 14, when Jesus predicts that Peter is not only going to drift from him, but is going to deny Jesus three times, you would have, I mean, people would have thought you were, Jesus was nuts because this is Peter who has walked on water with Jesus. This is Peter who has, you know, taken up a sword to try to uh, slice off a Roman's head to protect Jesus. And, and I mean, how did this even happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. It happened because Peter's relationship with Jesus drifted over time. And I want to show you in this Easter story four factors as to the drift in his relationship. And the one is overconfidence. Overconfidence. I set the stage for you. Um, uh, Jesus is eating the Passover meal with his disciples. And uh, this is the Last Supper. You've probably heard that or seen the big famous painting, right? Have you seen that? That's like the original selfie right there of, of everybody in the... Okay, but here's the deal. Jesus, in the midst of that meal, says, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And most of those disciples have this reaction like, what? No, it can't be, it can't be. Listen to how Peter responds. He says, even if all fall away, I will not. Do you hear the overconfidence in his voice? Do you hear the swagger? Do you hear a guy that says, hey, you know what? Even if the other peon disciples fall away, I will never fall away. Well, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. <laughs> Today, yes, tonight, before morning, before the rooster crows twice, 
You yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically. You know, as a principle, don't tell Jesus he's wrong, okay? <laughs> Just don't do that. But Peter says, hey, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. You see, there's an overconfidence here that leads to drift that we'll see will lead to destruction. And the way I see this overconfidence playing out in our lives today is I'll hear somebody say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm just flirting with her. Hey, you know what? I can go out to dinner with her. My wife doesn't have to know about it. Nothing's going to happen. That's overconfidence that leads to drift, that leads to destruction. Or somebody will say, you know what? Uh, I've just had a few beers, and my house is only a few miles away, so uh, just go ahead and give me the keys. That's overconfidence that leads to drift, that will lead to destruction. Hey, you know what? The Bible was written thousands of years ago. What does God know about running a business in 2014? And if I have to cut corners to make the bottom line work out, or if I have to tell a little white lie to, uh, to make the sale, to close the deal, well, then God should understand. That's overconfidence that leads to drift, that leads to destruction. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if you think you're strong, be careful that you don't fall. In Psalms, it says, the heart is deceitful. That means that we lie to ourselves. In Proverbs 16, 18, it says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. In Proverbs 12, 15, it says, there's a way that seems right to a man, and in the end, it just leads to destruction. You see, Peter was overconfident. It led to drift, and it leads to destruction. Let me give you number two. Number two is just plain laziness. Jesus is both fully God and fully man. And as a man, he gets tired. And as a man, he gets stressed. And one night, the Garden of Gethsemane, this, this Easter story, he goes out to pray. And the Bible says he's so stressed out that he sweat blood. You know, one of the things that he did to sort of you know, support him here is he brings his three friends with him to keep watch, to just be with him, to comfort, to support Peter, James, and John. Do you know what they did? Fell asleep on him. Literally, they fell asleep. Jesus comes back from praying, and he's like, ah! Rebukes them, goes back and prays some more, comes back again. Guess what they're doing? They're sleeping again. And Jesus says to Peter in verse 37, couldn't you stay awake with me for one hour? Hey, how many of you know that it takes work to have a great relationship? How many of you know that, that, that you've got to be willing to invest time? You've got to be willing to sacrifice them, some things. And, and some people just aren't willing to do what needs to be done to make a relationship great. Did you hear about the guy that was a little stressed out and he had to go to the doctor and so he brought his wife with him? And while he was there, the, the doctor checked him out, and afterwards he said, Sir, why don't you go sit in the car? He brings the wife in, and he says, Well, ma'am, I've got some bad news. Your husband's got a stress, a stress disorder that's just really bad news, and if we don't get on top of this, he could, well, it could be really bad. And he said, But here's, here's the good news. If you will take him home and just relieve any stress, just if you, when you cook, just, just make it um, uh, very healthy meals, and uh, don't burden him with any household chores or anything like that. And, and you know what? Anytime you can, if you can just rub his shoulders and rub his feet, if you, if you not nag him or burden him with your problems or anything for about 10 months, I'm pretty sure he can make a full recovery. And on the way home, the man looked over at the wife. He said, well, what did the doctor tell you? She said, oh, you're going to die. You, you are you're pretty much gone. That's it. Some people aren't willing to do the work that it takes to make a relationship great. You know how that plays out in our lives? You know how that plays out? It's when you come home and you've had a really busy day, and you know you probably should play basketball with your kids, or you probably should uh, 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 play board games with your kids, but instead you just flip on the TV because you know what? That's easy. Or you know, you know where it plays out is when you know that you should get up a little bit earlier, read your Bible, or go to the gym. But you know what's so much more inviting is your pillow. <laughs> or Sundays. I um, mean, you had a busy week. 
You know, Saturday night you were out late at a wedding or something like that, and Sunday morning comes and you just want to listen to Pastor Pillow, you know, Bedside Baptist Church. That's where I want to go, you know, just sleep in. But what happens then is because we're lazy, our relationships with our spouses, our kids, and our God begin to drift, and then destruction can happen. Let me give you a third one. Not just laziness, not just overconfidence, but look what Peter is. Then he sat, Peter sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. You know, Peter is with the wrong crowd. I mean, understand this. These are the same guys that that could be the very same guys that were marching Jesus up that hill. This could be the same group of guys that are that are whipping him. This could be the same guys that that are pounding the nails into his hands. And where is Peter? He's partying with them around this fire. He's hanging out with the enemy. Now, when I was growing up, my parents would say to me, hey, it matters who you hang out with. And I thought they were crazy. And now I have a 13-year-old. And guess what I say? Do you know how much it matters who you hang out with and who your friends are? And if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Here's what I believe. I believe your decisions determine your short-term future. But your relationships determine your long-term destiny. I really believe that. I really believe that the people you hang out with, good people, is going to take you toward a good destiny. Bad people are going to take you toward a bad one. And so for Peter, he's hanging out with the wrong crowd. It can create distance. It can create drift that can lead to destruction. You've seen that with marriages. You've seen that with business relationships. You've seen that with God. Here's a fourth one. Fourth one is just tough circumstances. In Mark 14, 54, it says, Peter followed him at a distance. Oh, man. There's the drift right there. Peter followed Jesus at a distance. Now, understand the way, the way it used to be for Peter. I mean, Peter came on the scene. He dropped his nets. He went to follow Jesus. And Jesus starts becoming more and more and more popular. Hundreds of people, thousands of people listening to this great teacher Everything is great, and Peter loves being right there through it all. Man, I am Jesus' bosom buddy. Man, I am Jesus' right-hand man. And when Jesus is multiplying fishes, I'm right there carrying baskets. When Jesus is walking on water, man, I step out of the boat with him. I want to be so close to Jesus because everything is going great. And I have this expectation that he's the Messiah and that he's going to get more and more popular. And one day he's going to call us to grab our swords and we're going to take over the Romans and we're going to be in charge now because we've got the Messiah on our side. So what happens when Jesus is being led out in shackles, Peter follows him at a distance. And the same thing happens to us when God doesn't meet our expectations for how quickly we think we should advance in our career, for how much money we think should be in our 401k, for as quickly as we think we should be able to have kids or have a spouse, or, or when our health goes the wrong way, we don't automatically just say, I quit on God. Most of the time, we just begin to follow him at a distance. See, the question for today is this. Relationships coming together or relationships drifting apart? Has there ever been a time in your life when you've been closer to Jesus than you are right now? Has there ever been a time in your life where you've been closer to Jesus than you are right now? Because if you can say yes to that, that means what you are experiencing is a bit of drift in your relationship. Now let me tell you how that played out for Peter. He's sitting around that fire. Somebody came up to him and said, hey, weren't you one of those followers of Jesus? He says, no, not me. And he denies Jesus one time. A second person comes up and says, hey, no, wait a second. Your accent betrays you. You you are, you sound just like the guy that was with him. No, not me. And Jesus denies Peter two times. And then finally somebody comes up and says, no, 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 you were with him. And Peter says, I don't even know the guy. And the rooster crows. And Peter knows that not only has his relationship drifted, but it has now been destroyed as he sold his friend down the river. Now, do you know what it's like to betray a friend, to realize, to have that aha moment when you realize you have blown it in a relationship, where you have blown it with God, where you have, I mean, it's a churchy word, but we're in church, so when you've sinned. 
I mean, Peter's experiencing guilt. He's experiencing shame. The Bible says that they locked eyes. I mean, he could see Jesus going out, and he denies him. And there's Jesus, just the guilt that he felt. And then, and then to see what happens after this, to see Jesus uh, 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 whipped, to see Jesus scourged, to see Jesus uh, marched up a hill, to see Jesus made fun of and abandoned, people saying crucify him, people turning on him, and, and, then, and then to see the nails piercing his wrists and piercing his feet, and to know that you are part of the reason that that happened, that your sin is part of the reason that he went up that hill. Guys, I don't have to imagine what that would feel like because I, in fact, am part of the reason that Jesus had to go up that hill. My sin. Your sin is part of the reason that Jesus had to lay down on a cross and allow mere human beings to drive nails through his hands and feet. When you've blown it, when you've screwed up. And so we don't have to imagine too hard what it would feel like to be Peter that night watching all the events of Easter play out. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Guys, that is the good news of Easter. Amen. The fact that when our love for our spouse dies, God can resurrect that. The fact that when our hope for a brighter future dies, God can resurrect that. The fact that our self-control over alcohol or anything else could die, but God can resurrect that, guys, that is the good news of Easter. The fact that we could have a relationship like Peter that drifts away from God and that Jesus could mend that back together, that is the good news of Easter. Let me tell you how this plays out for Peter. It says, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering, what happened? I mean, he didn't know. It wasn't like us where we've been talking about Easter bunnies for the last, you know, couple thousand years. This guy is on the scene, and there's no body. He has no clue what's just happened. And so he's just left to go back to his old life. And that's what he does. He just, he just goes back to fishing. That's all he ever knew. And so he, he just goes back to his nets. But one day, one day while they're out fishing, somebody says, hey, isn't that Jesus on the banks? And, and sure enough, it is. Jesus is on the beach, and he's made a fire. He's cooking breakfast of fish and loaves over a coal fire. And Peter takes one look, and in great Peter fashion, throws off his cloak, jumps in the water, run, uh, swims over there, gets out of the beach, and just comes right at Jesus. And now, this is the point where I want to push pause on the story and show you some detail. Because Jesus, again, has set a coal fire here, and, and the fish are on there, and the loaves are on there. And I imagine that what happened was that Peter ran up, all excited that Jesus is alive, but then he smelled the fire. Now, Scientists will tell us that our sense of smell, more than any other sense, is connected to memory. So that if I smell cut grass, I am immediately transported back to Little League Baseball. I mean, I, I smell it, and it's like, ah. Oh. Or if I smell Grandma's old sweet rolls, I am immediately sitting down for Thanksgiving dinner. Right? And it's more than just a memory. It's like you're there. Tommy Hilfiger cologne for me is and will always be the smell of a high school dance. Anybody with me on this? 
I mean, I can go in the mall and go past somebody, I catch one whiff, and I am, I am awkwardly slow dancing with a girl. I mean, it's, it's just like this. Never like this, but like this, because I went to Catholic school, and so the priests were always kind of like, hey, let's leave a little room for the Holy Spirit in there, Mr. Dummett, okay? Let's make sure, you know? So it was always like this, but I mean, I'm back there, and you can see the bad decorations, and you can hear the, the slow boys to men song, you know? It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. Right? You, <laughs> you, you were at the dance too, obviously. But that, the, the sense of smell just snaps you right back there. So when Peter is swimming and he sees Jesus and he runs up to the fire and he takes one whiff of that charcoal fire... You need to understand that fire was an anthrakia. That's the Greek word. Fire is used all throughout scripture, but there's only one other place in the whole Bible where anthrakia is used. A special kind of fire, a charcoal fire. And sure enough, it is the fire that Peter sat around with those guards the night that he betrayed Jesus. So you can imagine that he was transported in his mind right back to his failure right back to the guilt, right back to the shame. And he realizes that though everybody else can be celebrating the risen Lord, everybody else can be celebrating Easter, he came into contact with the fact that, you know what, my relationship with him is broken. Fortunately, we have a Jesus that wants to restore our relationship. That's part of the reason that he made the fire in the first place. Jesus wanted Peter to know that he knew and God wants you to know today that he knows. That secret sin that nobody else knows about that you keep coming back to over and over and over again, God knows. That thing that happened in your past that you don't talk about much anymore and, and you just try to get away from it, but it just keeps coming back, guess what? God knows. And he understands. And he offers you the same thing that he offers Peter. Because in that moment, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, teachers for hundreds of years have been trying to figure out what the these in more than these is. Some people will say, well, it's the disciples. Do you love me more than the rest of these disciples? But you know what? When Jesus was traveling with those disciples, he always seemed to discourage that kind of competition. And so I imagine that when Jesus said on that fisherman's wharf, Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? I imagine he was looking at some fish. Because fish to Peter weren't just fish. You remember the call for Peter the very first time was Simon Peter, lay down your nets and come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, Peter was laying down his career. Peter was laying down his, his security blanket. Peter was laying down his source of provision. Peter was laying down his, his uh, uh, comfort zone, all of it to follow Jesus. And now Jesus is reinstating Peter. He's saying, you know what? I, do you love me more than everything else? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, well, then feed my sheep which is a beautiful thing for Jesus to say. It's not as if Jesus said, okay, well, because, you've mis because of your mistake, you will always be a second-class citizen. And sure, I'm going to let you in, but it's always going to be on the outskirts. I, I, I mean, I, I'll do it because I'm Jesus, but I'm not really happy about it. He says, no, then come and feed my sheep. Come and be a leader in my movement. Come and be a, a, a world changer. Come and do the thing that I called you in the first place to do. See, Jesus doesn't just forgive. He restores so many times. Well, then a funny thing happens. Jesus asks the question a second time. Simon Peter, do you love me? I imagine Peter's going, we just did this. You know? <laughs> but he doesn't. He says, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, well, then feed my sheep. The third time, almost, the same, almost exactly the same thing. The third time. You see, three times Jesus... Uh, Peter betrayed Jesus, and three times Jesus restored him. Now, do you think, knowing what you do about Jesus, that the message of those three 
uh, uh, the, of the incident of that three. Do you think the message for you today is, hey, you get three strikes and then you're out with God? Is that the God that you think about and pray to? Or could the message be, hey, guys, for every time you blow it, I can restore you. For every sin you've committed, I can forgive you. For everything in your past, I am here to say, come back to me. Let's restore this relationship. No matter what drift you have experienced, let's come back together. Guys, I want you to know that every service that we've had here, there have been people, this is the sixth service this weekend, every service people have come forward and said, I want to give my life to Jesus. People have said, you know what, I walked in here, I wasn't expecting to do this, but I realize now that there's been a drift. I realize that I have never yet said I want Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. And I also realize that I have blown it. That there are things in my life where I have not lived up to the standards God has had for me. I mean, goodness, most of us don't even live up to the standards we have for ourselves. Right? Don't you want to be a certain kind of worker, a certain kind of man, a certain kind of wife, a certain kind of parent? And don't you sometimes look in the mirror and go, I don't even meet my own standards. And how much higher are God's standards for you? Guys, we have fallen short. And there have been people that have sat just where you have sat and experienced just what you've experienced and have said, you know what? Today's the day. Today's the day. I will come forward. I'm going to say yes to Jesus. We've had people to get baptized today. It's been an amazing weekend. And I believe that there are people in this room today that have come here, and today is your day. What better day than Easter? What reason would you have to wait another week, to wait another month? For many of you, today is the day that you say yes to Jesus for the very first time. If that's you, then during this song, I want you to come forward. There'll be people on either side. After the service, there'll be pastors and people up front that can help you make that decision. You want somebody to pray with, we'll pray with you. You have questions, we'll try to answer the questions. Now, there are other people here today that have been walking with Jesus for some time. But when I asked the question, have you ever been closer to Jesus than you are today, you realized you've drifted. Praise God. Praise God for Easter, a day that Jesus reminds us that your relationship with him is not based on your spiritual performance, but in Christ alone. Your relationship with Jesus, guys, is not based on how many times you go to church, how religious you are. It's not based on how many times you help an old lady across the street or how many times in the middle of the night you stub your toe and say a word you wish your grandmother wouldn't hear you say. You understand, no matter what your spiritual performance is, your relationship with Jesus is based on your faith in Christ alone and what he did on the cross. That's why in that upper room he tore some bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember that it is in Christ alone that you have hope. It is in Christ alone that you have salvation. It is in Christ alone that you can be restored to a relationship with the Father in Christ alone.